Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this video we are going to be looking at the metamorphic rock identification assignment. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at some images of some metamorphic rocks and we are going to try and classify them. Alright, so what exactly have you got? So what will you find in the content section of the class D2L page? Okay, so obviously the first thing you're going to find is the table. <clears throat> now your table is actually going to go from 36 to 47. Uh, sample number 36 doesn't actually exist, so ignore that one altogether. So yay, we are already head by one sample. Good work. So what can we see? Well, when we look at a sample, we are going to obviously now the rock name is going to come last. We're going to try and work out whether the rock is foliated or non-foliated. We're going to try and classify the type of foliation. If you look down here, we actually have types of foliation listed. So of course we have slaty cleavage, we have schistosity, we have nisic banding, and we have you know, a phyllite type foliation. Now each of these different types of foliation is going to be associated with a distinct type of rock. So slaty cleavage is associated with slates. Schistosities are associated with schists, nisic banding, nices, phyllite type foliation, phyllites. Not really a huge shock there. If your rock isn't one of those four, but it still has a foliation, it's just going to be referred to as foliated, and that's it. We're also going to try and think about our minerals, and we're going to try and think about what the protolith was. So what rock was metamorphosed to actually make the rock that we're seeing? And of course, the final thing will be actually naming the rock itself using the flowchart. So as you can see, we have the we have the flowchart here. We have numerous options. So if we come down here, is your rock foliated? Let, let's go for yes. OK, is your rock fine grained? Yes. So if it has an excellent cleavage but a dull appearance, it's going to be a slate. OK, remember, slates typically are foliated, but they are grey and pretty dull looking in appearance. If we continue down here, we have a phyllite that's like a slate, but it's slightly shiny. So if our rock is, it is not fine grained, so it's coarser grained, well, what might we get? If our rock is kind of sparkly in appearance, well, that's going to take us down this way towards the schists. Because remember, schists are very mica-heavy rocks. So lots of muscovite and sometimes lots of biotite. That can make them extremely shiny because those minerals are naturally very, very reflective. So in some instances, uh, mica schists, especially the, the muscovite ones, can literally look like you've taken a rock and wrapped it in tinfoil. So we have two different varieties of mica schists. Now, obviously, both of these types of schist are going to have a schistosity because a muscovite crystal, sorry, mica crystal, is very, very flat and very, very thin. So it's like a piece of paper. So, of course, you can knock those crystals over and make them align. So, once again, you'll have a, a foliation, and that foliation is referred to as a schistosity. Now, if the rock itself is just made up almost exclusively of mica, that's going to be a mica schist. If our rock is essentially dominated by mica, but also has some garnet mixed in there, it's going to be a garnet schist. Now note this term here, porphyroblasts. This essentially is a term that says we have you know, large garnet crystals in our sample. These garnet crystals are going to be larger than the other crystals that we see in our rock. So they're going to stand out, they're going to be really noticeable. Obviously, garnet, I'm sure you know, is a kind of very deep red color. So, okay, so uh, let's say we have a foliation, but the, you know, the minerals are coarse to medium grained. Our rock is not sparkly. Well, where are we going from there? Well, that's going to take us into alternating light and dark layers. And I'm sure you know by now, alternating light and dark layers means a nice. Okay, I'm sure you know that from the lecture. So if we continue in this direction, so we come down here, there are actually two types of nices. The first type is the regular nice. We just have those light and dark bands. The third type, the second type of nice, sorry, is what's referred to as an algon nice. So an algon nice has these little eye-shaped crystals in them, which are referred to as algons. And that's the result of the rock being sheared. So what you've got is you have a large crystal, a porphyroblast, typically something, or typically quartz or potassium feldspar. And as the rock gets sheared, it causes the crystal to develop essentially uh, 
how can I put this simply? It causes the crystal to develop two triangular zones either side of the crystal in which new minerals precipitate. And so what happens is you have your crystal in the middle and you have these two triangular zones either side and essentially it ends up looking like a football. And so that's what we end up with. And these, these football shaped you know, crystal masses are referred to as algans. So if we come up here again, if our rock is not foliated, well, what are our options? Okay, is it dark? Well, let's say it is, yes. If it's dark and fine-grained with a hardness of greater than six, so it's made up of lots of hard minerals, then it's going to be a hornfels. If, however, our rock is, not, is, is dark, but it is not harder than six, then we're heading this way. And so if our rock is essentially displays layering and conchoidal fractures, so that's essentially that's a, a scallop shaped uh, fracture surface on the rock, then it's going to be anthracite. I should point out anthracite is going to be very shiny as well. It's a naturally shiny rock. OK, let's say that our rock is not dark. If it contains pebbles, then we end up with a meta conglomerate. Now, when we come to the meta conglomerate in this presentation, I'm not actually going to try and, you know, I'm not going to make you work too hard. I'm actually going to tell you about meta conglomerates and how you can, you know, separate them from a you know, sedimentary conglomerate. So if it's not a meta conglomerate because it doesn't contain pebbles, well, then we have a couple of options. Obviously, we have a situation where our rock will react with acid. Obviously, that's going to be a marble because marbles are made of carbonate minerals typically calcite. Calcite reacts with acid. Or our other option is, of course, a quartzite. All right. So our quartzite is obviously going to be made of quartz, so it's going to have a hardness in excess of 6, so hardness of 7 on the Mohs scale, and it's obviously not going to react with acid. Okay, so these are our possible options. So let's get going and let's you know, have a look at you know, what we have in the box. So, okay, so the first sample in the box 37 looks like this. So we can see that it's very dark in color, and we can see that it has a you know, naturally shiny appearance to it. Okay. So the first thing is, is, is this rock foliated or non-foliated? Well, you can see, if you look at these surfaces here, there is a layering to it. Now, this is a situation where it gets a little complicated because we're trying to work out is this layering that we see a foliation or is this layering that we see some kind of remnant of the protolith so something that was in the protolith and has just been carried through to the rock that we see so this is a tricky one so how can I make you decide well the, the thing is is the layering that we see here is not made up of obvious crystals first of all but it's also quite coarse okay it's not lots and lots of very very fine layers you can kind of see here you're getting these kind of chunky layers that are you know maybe a few centimeters thick so this is obviously different to the you know the other rocks that we've seen where these layers are made of very very fine microcrystals and these layers are often you know a few millimeters or maybe even less than the millimeter in thickness so this is different and it would suggest that maybe this is a remnant of the protolith so the original material had layers in it now if we were to you know if we were to hold this particular sample we would find that it would be extraordinarily light it really wouldn't weigh that much so that would suggest that whatever makes it up is very very light as well so you know it's obviously not going to be made of stuff like you know iron or lead or plutonium because obviously that would be very very heavy so we know that whatever's making up this sample must be light it must be kind of quite high in the periodic table towards the top so if we were also to look at this sample and we were to um, touch it we would find that it would be quite a quite a robust sample but if you were to pull it across a surface like a piece of cement, it would leave a black line behind it as it moved because it has a very, very high organic content. Okay, It's kind of similar to you know, graphite in that respect. 
So this particular rock is dark in color. It's shiny. So I'm looking to see if it has any distinct type of fracture. You can just kind of see one right here. Okay. So this is a conchoidal fracture, one of these scallop shaped fractures that we see. Okay. So this particular rock has conchoidal fracture. Coarse layering, which is not a foliation, it's a layering, so it's a you know, remnant of the original rock. It's dark in color. Its hardness is going to be you know, relatively low. It's probably going to be a hardness of two or three on the scale. And no, that's a no. No, probably going to be a hardness of about three or four, actually. Do excuse me. Okay. It's going to be amazingly light. And obviously, as you can see, it's extremely reflective. Okay. In terms of the mineral composition, well, once you work out what type of rock it is, then you can come back and have a think about the mineral composition. Okay. So, you know, just remember that if the sample is too fine grained for you to actually see the minerals, well, you can't really name them accurately. So you're just going to go for, you know, what would be a general makeup for this particular type of rock. And then you're going to think of what the parent rock is. Okay. So once again, in this particular instance, I would strongly advise you to just take a second to go to Google and just very quickly Google this rock and find out, you know, what it's made from. Okay. So this is a particularly tricky one to start. It's not an easy one, but once you work it out, and I, I think you will work it out, you'll actually go, oh, that's really obvious. Okay. On to 38. All right. 38. What do we see? Okay, number one, is this rock foliated or non-foliated? Can you see layers in it? Well, you probably can, can't you? But you might not. Let's see what you write down. So if it is foliated, what kind of foliation is it? So if we look at this rock, what can we see? Well, we can see that it's it looks kind of zebra-esque, doesn't it? Okay, so it has these lighter regions, these lighter bands, and these darker bands so that's going to help you kind of begin to work out what type of rock it might be and therefore if it does have a foliation what type of foliation that is so now let's have a think about the mineral composition okay so if we have a look so i've got a close in shot of the rock here what can we see well we can see here we have a crystal okay and if we look carefully, we can see this crystal has a kind of stepped appearance to it, doesn't it? It's not a nice smooth surface. It has steps. It's got cleavage. Okay. In fact, in order to make those steps, it has to have two cleavages, doesn't it? It has to have one cleavage, two cleavages. Yes. And then repeat it again. One cleavage, two cleavage. And so in the end, that's going to produce a step-like surface. Okay. The feldspar class of minerals are well known for having two cleavages. I'm just going to say that now. Whereas quartz is cleavage free. So the next thing is, is well, what mineral is this? Now, it's the eye of faith here, and you may not agree with me, but I, th I would say that these larger crystals do have a slight pinkish tinge to them in my opinion. So I'm sure you remember, so think about it, if you go back to your mineral notes, we know that there is a particular mineral that tends to occur and have a pinkish colour. Shall I say salmon? So as for all this finer grain material, well that's it, that's rather difficult to work out what's going on there. Um, I would also say of course then we have these darker layers okay once again we can't tell what the mineral is however if you were to hold this sample and move it around in the light what you would notice is that the dark mineral that makes up this layer or the layer sh should I say is extremely reflective so it's a dark mineral which is extremely reflective Okay, that's going to help you work out what mineral may be dominating these darker bands. Okay, now the one thing that we are going to discuss very briefly is the fact that we have these football-shaped crystals here. 
okay so just take note of them you can see here's here's a nice example here here's it slightly closer up you can see this lenticular football kind of form okay and you can see a few more examples in the rock you can see you've got one up here you have one up here as well okay so this rock has a few of them distributed through it so okay so what have we got so far well we know obviously it has a zebra like appearance we know it has these football shaped crystals in there. We know that one of the minerals has this stepped appearance suggesting two cleavages. We know that the other mineral one of the other minerals, this dark mineral, is highly reflective. And that's about it. So this one should be a relatively easy one for you to crack. Now the final question is what's the parent rock? Now, for this one, you're going to have to go back to the lecture material and you're going to have to try and see what the parent rock for this particular type of metamorphic rock is. Okay. Okay. On to 39. Ah, 39. Quite a lovely sample. So the first thing you'll notice is 39 looks very, very shiny, doesn't it? it looks kind of like we've wrapped it in foil okay so instantly this is telling us this particular rock is dominated by a mineral which is highly reflective the light is bouncing off it the other thing we have to note about this mineral is is it is light in color so we have a very light highly reflective mineral dominating this rock in terms of the texture, well, what can we see? On the top, you can't see very much. But if we look at the sides, well, we can quite clearly see this rock undoubtedly has a foliation, doesn't it? Super duper clear. So the next question is, is, well, what type of foliation is it? Well, you can do that once you've actually named the rock. Chances are you've probably got a good idea what this rock is already, but let's keep going. So now let's think about the mineral composition. What can we see? Well, obviously we have this highly reflective light mineral. Okay, that's making up a very large proportion of the rock. Then in between these layers of this very, very light mineral, now ignore this uh, kind of like brownish orange area here. That's just staining. That's not a mineral, so ignore that. You can see we do have these bands of material which if you look very very carefully are somewhat glassy in appearance there's lots and lots of glassy material in there and there's some other material in there which I'm going to tell you now it's feldspar you can't see it in these pictures you can just kind of make up the glassy crystals there's one here there's one here in fact if you actually open up the PowerPoint presentation and just, you know increase the size of this picture you should be able to make out the glassy crystals quite easily so you can see we have layers in between these you know, very reflective silver minerals and you can see they're dominated by a glassy mineral and there's some feldspar in there as well now you'll also notice that there is another mineral present you can kind of see a crystal of it here a crystal of it here another crystal of it here this is a darker mineral and if we come down here we can see that this particular mineral has a color to it okay it has a very noticeable deep red color okay so that should be helpful the other thing you'll notice is if you look at the crystals you can kind of just about see it here these particular crystals almost form little spheres okay so you've got what appears to be a you know rounded well uh, spherical should I say uh, mineral that has a very deep red color to it okay and these crystals are noticeably larger in size than the crystals which they are associated with that means they are porphyroblasts okay so these particular minerals are porphyroblasts so you should be able to name several minerals for this rock go back to your mineral notes and use those to guide you in your identification now, obviously, once you've worked out what this rock is dominated by, it's going to take you very, very quickly to what the rock is. And so that's going to help you work out what type of foliation this is. All right. 
we've done the minerals and then finally you have to think about what the parent rock is well once again go back to the lecture that's going to help you work it out straight away okay sample 40 well sample 40 is a once again it's a pretty straightforward rock so if we look at sample 40 what can we see is it foliated I'm gonna let you answer that one we can also see in terms of the uh, minerals we can see that we have pinkish minerals and we have darkish minerals don't we okay so we can see this band here has a very very distinct pinky dare I say salmon color to it okay that's gonna give you some idea of what mineral may well be present in these particular bands in quite large quantities all right you can't see it but in these bands here there will also be some quartz thrown in for good measure okay so these layers consist of a, a, a mineral which has a salmon-esque tone to it and some quartz which we can't really see now the darker layers uh, well that's a bit difficult it's difficult because whatever the original mineral was it's gone so if we look down here can you kind of see how these layers here have a somewhat greenish tint to them well what's happened here is the minerals that made up these darker layers have actually altered and they've altered as the rock has become cooler because this particular type of rock tends to form in rather high temperature high pressure conditions so the minerals which make it up will be pre will typically be stable in high temperature high pressure environments now this means that as your rock cools down some of these minerals as they enter as they enter cooler and lower pressure environments will suddenly become unstable and you'll have to change into new minerals and you know what we're seeing here is the event is the sign of this process so whatever was making up these darker layers here was stable at higher temperatures but it's not stable anymore so it's turning into something new and so we can see whatever mineral it's turning into has this rather distinct greenish color okay and so that there's a couple of you know possible uh, possible causes the most likely mineral is a mineral called chlorite c h l o r i t e and chlorite will typically replace uh, minerals like uh, biotite and minerals like pyroxene and amphibole so minerals like hornblende it could also be actinolite a c t i n o l i t e and actinolite is a type of uh, amphibole and that will very commonly replace pyroxene and hornblende which is another type of amphibole oh sorry it will replace pyroxenes and hornblende which and other dark amphiboles so these layers of a slight greenish tint it could be chlorite it could be actinolite chances are it's chlorite but we can't be 100% certain so it could be either okay you may also notice if you look at the picture here that our sample has lots of little spots in it okay so there is another mineral and if we zoom in here we can see one of these spots right there notice how it has a nice deep red color okay think about our previous sample deep red colored minerals oh look more deep red colored minerals could they be the same chances are yes okay so once again this one's a, a real sitter you should be able to work this one out pretty easily ah 41 a challenging one this one's not a particularly nice sample at all so what's the first thing we realize well obviously it's dark in color and when we look at it what do we see well the answer is not a lot it's pretty fine grained and I've got to be honest it's rather unspectacular isn't it okay that's not really going to help us very much so what we need to do is we need to try and work out what we're dealing with well first of all is it foliated 
there, well, I'm going to give you the honest answer. There's no signs of any kind of foliation on this sample whatsoever. It's foliation free. In terms of minerals, well, this one's a bit of a tricky one as well. We can't really see. Now, the crystals are just too small, but once again, we can see that our rock here has a greenish tint. And this greenish tint has this kind of, you know, darkish, grayish, greenish color. Once again, chlorite and actinolite would be very likely culprits for this color can't be certain but it would be a reasonable bet to say that they're causing it so the color of the rock does hint that you know they may be present we'll also no you'll, you can also notice that we do have the occasional dark crystal in our rock and you can see one right here now this dark crystal would be highly reflective so you have a highly reflective dark crystal present as well now, as for the rest of this rock, uh, that's pretty tricky. So, what else can we say about this particular rock? Well, one of the things we can say about this particular rock is if you were to try and scratch it, you would have a very difficult time scratching it. Okay? If you were to take a, you know, a cheap steel blade and try and scratch the rock, you probably wouldn't be able to do it. Okay? So, you know, typically a cheap steel blade is going to have a hardness of somewhere in the region of about five five and a half so obviously this particular rock has a has a uh, a hardness in excess of five and a half so that's really all we can say about this sample now when we come on to what the possible parent rock for this sample could be well once again go back to the lectures because that's going to help you work out what the possible parent rock for this could be Okay, on to our next sample. All right, well, this one's a, once again a real sitter, and you can te you can see why. You can see why this particular sample, if you put acid on it, it will fizz. It will vigorously react with acid. All right, that's going to give us a very very strong hint about what mineral makes up this particular sample. And I think when you look at this sample, you will probably agree with me that this sample is nearly monomineralic it's just one mineral okay so we know that this mineral reacts with acid vigorously so we know what mineral it is so you know this close-up picture here doesn't really do as much good does it the one thing I will say is that this particular sample is very very equigranular so all the crystals are about the same size okay so this is going to be a term we refer to as granoblastic Okay, so granoblastic means that the crystals that we see are about the same dimensions, you know, all everywhere in this particular sample. So in terms of the mineral composition, you can work that out from wherever it's got, you know, work that out from, from the fact it reacted with acid. You can work out whether it's foliated or not. Well, look at this picture here. I'm sure you can crack that. Parent rock, you can definitely work out what that was. Done. Okay, this is sample 43, and I'm going to tell you right now, this is the meta conglomerate. Okay, now I, I didn't take a picture of this, so unfortunately, shame on me. Uh, it's not, uh, the, so all these pictures, well, this, these two pictures at least are from external sources. They're both from Wikipedia, whereas this picture is actually of a sedimentary conglomerate. Okay, so how do you tell the difference between a meta conglomerate, like this sample here, and a regular sedimentary conglomerate. So in terms of the class themselves, you can see the class here and the class in this rock here. You know, If they're made of unreactive minerals like these granite class are and these quartz, quartz, quartz class are, well, they're not going to metamorphose. So not much is going to happen to them. And what you're going to find is in a lot of clastic material, I'm sorry, should I say a lot of coarse clastic material, the kind of stuff that's going to produce conglomerates, a lot of the time the clasts do tend to be made from more robust material. So you will tend to find quite a lot of you know, granite and other quartz, quartz related uh, rocks in there. So the clasts themselves, well they're not going to metamorphose very easily. Now what is going to metamorphose is the matrix between the clasts. Okay. So if we just come back to this picture up here, 
of our sedimentary conglomerate, we can see the matrix running through here. It's this powdery white looking stuff. Now, this powdery white looking stuff is, as you can see, clastic. That's why it looks powdery. All right. So this looks like you could essentially rub your finger on it and it would fall to pieces. You could scratch it, it'll break into pieces. Now compare that to this sample here. All right. Now we can see we have numerous clasts, but if you look at the matrix in between them, well, that matrix does not look powdery, does it? It looks almost like the class themselves. It looks like it's dominated by quartz. Okay, so the loss of this powdery matrix is one of the signs that your conglomerate may well have been metamorphosed. So that's the first thing that we're going to keep an eye out for. Now, another very interesting way that we can work out whether our rock is a metaconglomerate or just a regular sedimentary conglomerate is fractures, or should I say, are fractures. So if we look at this sample here, okay, if this rock fractures, how is it going to fracture? Well, what's going to happen is it's going to break along the matrix, and if the fracture comes anywhere near a clast, it's going to go around the clast in the vast majority of cases. Okay? That's because you know there's a there's a loose connection between these clasts and the matrix. So if you, you know put enough force on the rock, this contact here between the two of them will just come apart. Okay, so fractures will move through the matrix and they'll typically go around class. They will not go through them. Now, in contrast, once you've metamorphosed your conglomerate and, you know, typically the, the matrix that does most of the altering, most of the recrystallization. And as this matrix recrystallizes, the clasts and the matrix are really going to start fusing together. I mean, really fusing together to form one robust unit. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that when we have a metaconglomerate and it fractures, it's not uncommon for the fractures to go through the matrix and the crystals. And we can see a couple of examples of that right here. So if we look at this fracture, we can see it's coming through this B class right here, cutting straight through it, and then it's cutting through the matrix, cuts through this class here, then it gets stepped to one side, cuts through this class here, cuts that class there, cuts the matrix for a bit, and then cuts this class here. Okay, so it's cutting through the lot. We can see another fracture over here, which I saw just a second ago, and now I've gone and lost it. Good work, me. Okay, we can see that sometimes the fractures do go around the class as well, so you know that's still going on to some degree. But fractures, you know, cutting through clasts like this one here, as you can see, it's looping down into this class here and then looping back out again. And if we look carefully, we can see this class here is also cut by a fracture. And this class here is also cut by this bifurcating fracture right here. So this single fracture that's splitting into two. So what you're seeing is, is the rock is behaving as a single unit. So when it fractures, it doesn't matter you know, what's fracturing. The fracture will just continue through the matrix and the clasts. So that's a good indicator that this is a metaconglomerate, whereas this is a regular sedimentary conglomerate. Now, in some instances, your, your conglomerate will have minerals in it that will actually metamorphose quite easily. So maybe if you're lucky, you have a rock that contains a well, conglomerate, conglomerate that contains quite a lot of clay minerals, or you have a conglomerate that contains quite a lot of mafic igneous rocks. Well, when that happens, they're going to metamorphose and you're going to be able to see those changes quite easily. Obviously, a very clay rich, uh, met, uh, a very clay -rich conglomerate would produce quite large quantities of mica. And a quite mafic, igneous rock rich conglomerate would produce something that looks like this. OK, so you can see now in terms of these granite class here, they are relatively unaffected by what's going on around them. However, the rest of the material, the matrix and the darker class, well, they are of mafic igneous origin. And so as the metamorphic grade has been increasing, they will begin to metamorphose. And remember, they're going to go green schist fasces, amphibolite fasces, granulite fasces. In this case, I think we can quite certainly agree, if you look at the colour, we are most definitely in green schist fasces, aren't we? You can't deny that one. 
And so what we're seeing here in particular is you can notice we have this rather, you know, apple green, a slight green with a hint of yellow kind of color. So this is the mineral epidote, first of all. Okay, so epidote is one of the three minerals that we need essentially to be in green chest fasces. The other two are chlorite and actinolite. And I think it's pretty fair to say if I was to take a, you know, a good look at this rock and take a sample to look down a microscope, I would find epidote, chlorite and actinolite in huge quantities in this rock. So what we have here is a rock that's very clearly been metamorphosed. And here we have a rock that is more difficult to classify as a metaconglomerate, but we can see that the matrix has recrystallized to form typically a very quartz rich material. And we can also see that because it's recrystallized, the entire rock is behaving as one solid unit rather than a load of class and some matrix. So that means when it fractures, any fracture will cut across both clasts and the matrix. In contrast, a, a regular sedimentary conglomerate, when it fractures, the fracture will move through the matrix and it will typically go around the clasts. Okay, so th that's the kind of stuff we look for when trying to work out, is it a sedimentary conglomerate? Is it a metaconglomerate? Okay, so we'll just very quickly try and classify this one for our, uh, for our table. So th this will be sample 43. I know it's not one from our actual department, but you know, it's what we got, so let's roll with it. So texture, is it foliated? We can work that one out for yourself. Mineral composition, well, Difficult to tell, isn't it? The class themselves are made of vein quartz. The ground mass, oh, that's tricky. We don't know. So all we can really say is quartz, a whole load of quartz. In terms of the parent rock, I think you can work that one out. And the rock name, well, I've already given it to you, so yeah. Okay, so that's sample 43. So that's how we tell the difference between a sedimentary conglomerate and a meta-conglomerate. Okay, sample 44. Well, sample 44, we are back with another shiny rock, aren't we? So you can see once again, this rock is very reflective and it's very light in color. So this obviously reflects the mineral, which is also very light in color and very, very reflective. If we look at this rock on the sides, we can see we have quite easily definable and visible layers, don't we? Yeah. So this rock is dominated by this highly reflective silvery mineral. Now, once again, between these layers of the silvery mineral, we do have these buildups of a glassy looking mineral. We can kind of see it right here. And in this case, we do have small crystals of a you know, very dark red mineral. Now, these small crystals are not porphyroblast kind of size. They're just, you know, regular sized crystals for this rock. Okay. So, you know, they're of relatively minor concern. They're a small constituent of the total makeup of this rock. So this rock is dominated by this silvery highly reflective mineral okay now just to make it clear this uh orange red staining we can see it here here and all the way across here that's just staining it's nothing to do with the minerals okay so this rock is dominated by one mineral which hopefully you can work out pretty quickly okay I'll give you a clint. It's uh, give you a hint. Sorry, it's uh, it's you know the name of it is related to uh, the country of uh, Russia. Okay, so hopefully you can you know kind of come up with the answer with that hint as well. If you didn't you know if you couldn't work it out already. Um, in terms of the whether it's foliated or non-foliated, you can work that one out. In terms of the type of foliation, well, once you've classified the rock, you'll be able to classify the type of foliation. Mineral composition, we know it has this silvery mineral, we know it has this glassy mineral, we know it has this dark red mineral, and although you can't see it, within these you know coarser mineral bands in between this shiny lighter mineral, you would also have some feldspar in there as well, but we can't see it in the picture. Okay. 
but it would be there. In terms of the rock itself, it's really dominated by this shiny light mineral and this deep red mineral is a very minor constituent and the crystals are very small. Okay. In terms of the parent rock, well, it's going to be the same parent rock that we had for the earlier sample that looked strikingly like this. Okay, so on to the next sample. 45. Ah, 45 is an interesting one. So what do we see when we look at 45? Well, when we look at 45, we see a rock that's a kind of medium gray kind of color you know not much spec you know not much you know this is spectacular going on however what do we notice well the first thing we notice is a particular rock is very strongly foliated okay we can see the layering very very easily in fact we can see the layers are actually very finely folded okay that's called a, you know, it's been what we refer to as crenulated. So the, the foliation has been folded and it's caused it to go up and down like slow, like so. So we can see that in this picture here. So we obviously have a rock that's very clearly foliated. That's not, you know, difficult to work out. Now, obviously, the type of foliation you'll work out once we name the rock. Okay, so what do we notice about this rock? Well, number one, the minerals themselves are very, very fine grained. But when we look at this rock and we look at this rock here in particular, I think it's fair to say that it doesn't look dull, does it? It looks kind of shiny, almost maybe a, a little bit wet in appearance. So it has a slight shine to it. So it's kind of a fine grained, medium grey rock with, with a shiny edge, with a shiny tint to it. So this is maybe going to help to push you um, in the direction as to you know what it could be. Now, once if you have some idea about what it could be, the minerals that make it up should be rather straightforward. So in terms of what makes up this particular sample, we have a lot of very, very fine grained uh, dull minerals. OK, so those particular minerals are relatively uh, unstable low metamorphic temperatures, low metamorphic grades, and they'll very quickly break down to form small crystals of a light, very, very shiny mineral. Think previous sample. So this particular rock has this very light, shiny mineral, but the crystals of it are very, very small. So that's going to give the rock that kind of shiny appearance to it. Now, the vast majority of this rock, though, has not turned into this light shiny mineral yet okay so once you work out what this rock is then obviously you'll be able to know what the light shiny mineral is and then from there you'll be able to work out what the mineral that's altering to give you the light shiny mineral is okay once again if you can't work it out try and work out what the rock is then go back to the lectures and you know listen in and then return once you you know, have a better understanding of what you should be seeing, okay? In terms of the parent rock, well, as you can see, it's clearly dominated by clay minerals. So you can probably work out that it's going to be some kind of sedimentary rock and probably quite a clay-rich sedimentary rock. Okay, 46. Now, 46 looks very, very shiny. And that's because when I was using this particular sample to take a photograph of it, the sample was in a pretty bad way. It was very dusty, very, you know, very scratched. And so what I had to do is I had to very quickly rinse it under a tap to get rid of all the, the dirt and grime so I could get a nice clean face to actually photograph. So this sample is not shiny, okay? When it is dry, it looks like this. It is dull. So we just need to make that very, very clear. Okay. I should also point out that because I have put the water on it, this sample appears to be darker than it really is. When it is dry, it looks like this. It's a kind of medium dark grey in colour. It, you know, when, the, when it's got the water on top of it, it looks kind of a very, very, very dark grey. But it's not. It's a medium 
to medium darkish grayish kind of color. Okay, so what can we see with this sample? Well, is it foliated? We'll have a look down here and work it out. I think you can probably crack that one. Okay, so mineral composition. Well, we can see the rock is extremely fine grained and you can't really see any crystals at all. All these lighter crystals you can see here, that's just dirt, that, that's just the kind of dirt that was on the sample. Okay, so these aren't actually related to the sample itself, that's just contamination. The sample itself is made of fine grained, uh, fine grained crystals, which we can't see. And the sample itself is quite dark, but it would be very dull in appearance, okay, if it wasn't wet. We can also see it's clearly, you know, well, it's clearly insert the correct word here. And so, you know, we you can work out pretty quickly where you should go on that flow chart. Okay. And that is it. So sample 46 is the end. So if you have any questions, obviously you can ask me during office hours at the uh, allotted time and day. Uh, and apart from that, go slowly. Think about what I've said, muddle as it may be. Just try and listen to what I'm saying. I'm trying to put the points to you without giving away the answers, which I know is quite difficult and therefore makes it you know, a little bit tricky to actually say what I want to try and say. So just try and bear with me, try and re-listen to what I'm saying and hopefully you'll you'll work it out. You should be able to do this relatively easily. You know, I trust you guys, you guys are smart, so you should be able to crack this one with relatively little effort. Okay, everyone, so try it. If you can't do it, email me, contact me during office hours, and we can discuss it. Okay, everyone, take care.